Fair, welcome to tonight's Open Your Eyes People broadcast. I'm your host evangelist, Anita Rivera. It is May 17th, 2000, 2021. And friends, um, it is stunning the developments that are happening over in the Middle East concerning the nation of Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Uh, right now, uh, uh, there's been a case for a ceasefire that has been made. I want to give you some updates. I want to show you what the Bible has to say about all of this because it continues to prove that we're living in the last days according to biblical prophecy, according to what the scriptures say, according to what Jesus says. So please, if you don't have your Bible, take a moment and grab it because we're going to be getting all into um, the word of God in conjunction with what I'm going to share with you concerning the headlines. All right. Biden, President Biden calls for an Israel-Palestinian ceasefire amid bipartisan pressure for end of bloody conflict. The, the bloody uh, mess, the war really that's been happening between Gaza and Israel. President Biden voiced support for a ceasefire, uh, excuse me, he voiced support for a ceasefire between Israel and Gaza's militant Hamas rulers on Monday, just today, after his administration at first distanced itself from bipartisan and international calls for an immediate end to the increasingly bloody conflict which has left hundreds of people dead, most of them Palestinians, most of them Palestinians. Biden made the case for a ceasefire in a phone call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, according to a readout from the White House as airstrikes and rocket attacks barraged the region for the eighth straight day. Now, when, uh, you know, you know, coming from, uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu's corner, he says, listen, we're going to continue to pound Gaza. We're going to continue to annihilate them. As a matter of fact, we are placing our own vow to continue striking this place. So, uh, you know, I don't know if Biden's calls are really going to be heated, if they're going to pay attention. But what I find interesting, friends, what I find interesting, and I'm going to give you a timeline, I'm going to give you some updates, I'm going to tell you why, because we want to know why. Many people are saying, okay, we've heard about this situation before. Is this a third intifada that's going to be taking place from the Palestinian Authority and uh, their fellow, uh, I'll say, helpers or workers, but we all know that, uh, you know, the Palestinian Authority does not work on their own. It's, it's going to include Lebanon, this war. This, this war is going to include Hezbollah, just as we know. It may also usher in Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, I mean, we we know clearly Hamas is involved with the Palestinians, and that could be uh, what the Word of God prophesies in Psalm chapter 83, talking about the tents of Edom and making the name of Israel to be no more. But, uh, you know, what I found stunning is the Abrahamic Accords that was just signed about a year ago, friends. Here we are, we're May 17, 2021, and the Abrahamic Accords was to help bring peace in the Middle East. This was done under the Trump administration. And, you, you know, I have to say this, you know, respectful to with, you know, you know, to whom, you know, to with whomever is going to be seated at the White House, uh, you know, whether Biden, which, uh, you know, clearly he's the president of the U.S., but whoever had the seat of the highest office in the world, which happens to be the presidency of the United States of America, the Abrahamic Accords should have stuck. There is absolutely no reason why we should be hearing or seeing conflict over in the Middle East, especially when it comes to the nation of Israel, especially when it comes to the Palestinian Authority. How are you going to talk about the Abrahamic Accords? How is this going to be signed again approximately a year ago? And uh, now we see this mess. This to me is mind boggling. Was this a show? Was the Abrahamic Accords a show? I would dare question all the leaders and all the signatories who were involved in this covenant that took place again last year, approximately a year ago, with regards to the Middle East that was to bring a peace in the Middle East. Now, of course, friends, I speak now as an evangelist. I tell you there, there can be no peace in the Middle East without the Prince of Peace being none other than Jesus. But Jesus himself said in the Gospels, he said, listen, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Understand that you're living in the last days. But listen, not many people believe that we're living in the last days. So now they're going to try to usher in their own peace. And Jesus said, listen, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give unto you. Meaning that the world has their own false peace and security. And we're warned about this false peace and security. Now, false peace means any peace outside of Jesus. And we're told in the scriptures that when they say peace and safety, 
Then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Could this be the sudden destruction that was talked about, that was that was prophesied to us with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Will World War III break out amid the current bombing and the continued airstrikes that are happening? Right now, the Palestinians are really suffering a large barrage of rockets, and many of people are saying, yeah, but, you know, they deserve it. Go, nation of Israel. Listen, I'm all for the Jewish people, but we have to remember that there are, uh, there are you know, precious believers. There are Palestinian Christians that live in the Gaza Strip. There are people that, uh, you know, that, you know, not everybody, you know, not all, all, you know, not all believers live in the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, the nation of Israel is a, is a large population of unbelievers. And so we, we have to really um, be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves in the midst of all that's taking place in the Middle East. But let me go back to the Abrahamic Accords for a moment. And then I want us to get further into uh, what's going on with the conflict, with the situation over in the Middle East. Um, we all remember that the Abrahamic Accords uh, was a again a peace deal, and I want to give you just a uh, just a uh, just a brief update, if, if you will. Give me one moment, because I did not anticipate to go this far. Okay, so uh, let's see here. With regards to the um, the, uh, the Abrahamic Accord. Uh, clearly, we know that there have been many attempts to bring forth a peace deal, to have a peace deal brokered in the Middle East, uh, and they've all ended in failure. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, I believe this one is also showing up and showing out to be ending in failure because this peace deal uh, that included uh, in, you know, nations such as uh, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, they all joined the Abraham Accords and the, 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 you know, the process was to start to normalize, uh, you know, Israel and their allies for them to be one, but it's, it's not the case. And so um, this conflict is proving that it's, you know, that, that we're, we're, we're going to come to a forefront to where uh, something dramatic is going to happen in the Middle East, and this may include uh, that major peace, that, that, that constantly fought uh, land that is called Jerusalem. And the Bible has something to say with regards to Jerusalem, and it's found in Revelation chapter 11, and I'll read that to you here in a moment. But let's, uh, um, I want to share with you a bit more concerning the Abraham Accords. Signatories to the Abraham Accords, meaning those who signed this covenant, approximately a year ago, defended a normalization of ties with the nation of Israel by saying that it would allow them to exert leverage over Israel. That has not been the case. The conflict between Israelis and Palestinians have never been balanced. And the question many say is, can it? Will it? Others say, oh, absolutely. No, it cannot. Not at this day and age, not in this time. And that's where you have many in the church have gone apostate and they're trying to bring in their, their own kingdom reign, their own kingdom era. It's called, dominion, what's it called, dominionism? Where they say, oh, we can rule and reign as Christ on the earth until he comes and sets up shop and becomes a leader of the free world. What you're going to get is the Antichrist. Don't fool me. There's no way you're going to fool a believer in Christ whose, names is, who, whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Understand that all, not everybody who goes to church is a friend of Israel. Not everybody who goes to church is a friend of God. They don't have the faith of Abraham through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. It's very important because many will claim to have the faith of Abraham and that's where they're trying to bring all these religions into one. But it's not through Jesus. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. According to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible tells us that for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. What government is this? It's not talking about any other government except the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, which will rule and reign all kingdoms of the earth. But first, we're told in 2 Thessalonians that let no one deceive you by any means, for before that day comes, it will be a great falling away, and then the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. And the peacemaker that these people are going to get, that the Middle East and all the signatories and all who are involved, even in the church, 
is going to have the Antichrist. And, and he's going to rule and reign for what the Bible calls a time, times and a half a time. And they think they're ready for this. They think that this is going to be the peacemaker. This is why they have the Noahide laws for, uh, you know, the Jewish people, for those who are a part of the Sanhedrin and the building of the Third Temple, that they're very serious of. They've been shedding the blood of animals. They've been, you know, they got their red heifer. They got all the instruments needed for the building of the Third Temple. And you have the, you know, the high priest garments and the church is involved in this. Not everybody in the church. And they say, well, those who aren't involved, we'll just call them the dead church. We'll call them, you know, we'll call them obsolete. As a matter of fact, we will renounce them. We will disown them. Listen, brother will rise up against brother in the last days, we're told. And uh, just as we're also told in the scriptures, the apostle Paul said, or, or, or was in Peter. Peter said that they... Uh, here, oh no, it was John, the Apostle John. He said here in the first epistle of John, chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. And that includes many in the church. That includes leaders in the church, teachers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors. And that's why we're told immediately in the next verse here, in verse 20, but you, when you see all these things taking place, you know that you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. In other words, God will cover you in that time. And I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you also know that no lie is of the truth. In other words, God does not have a double mind. These people will. The church will be involved in the unveiling of the Antichrist before we know it. They're involved in this mess, in this conflict. I believe that many in the church have blood on their hands. And they will refuse to admit it. But the reason why they have blood on their hands is because they've abandoned their post of being watchmen on the wall. Instead, they decided, again, to turn apostate. They decided to, um, to you know, give heed to, you know, to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And please understand that many did not just fall suddenly, because the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. And they will say, well, I have to deny the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth for the sake of peace and safety in the Middle East, for the sake of the Abraham Accords, for the sake of us being brother and, and, and you know, bringing this form of unity and love and loving thy neighbor as thyself with my Muslim friend and my, my friend over in Krishna, my friend in Buddhism, my friend uh, who, who's a Catholic. And, and, you know, many of these people don't believe that Jesus is the Lord. Many of them don't know that Jesus is the Messiah. And if they, if they hear it, they reject it. Okay, then listen, you, we, the, the moment that that happens, we're to be going with God. We're not to be renouncing our faith. We're not to be hiding it. Oh, oh we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna deny you, Lord, for the sake of you know, us doing what you said. No, there's no that, that, that's confusion. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all the church. And then again, he does not have a double-minded, he, he is not double-minded. We're told in the book of James chapter 1 that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let him not think that whatever he's even asking for the Lord, from the Lord to give him in prayer, that he's going to even be able to receive because he's double-minded. And that's what the Abrahamic Accords is, is a double-minded accord. And it will always bring conflict. It will not ever be stable. You're asking to build a house on a foundation of sand, and the moment that, that the water comes in, it's going to wash it away. Don't even get me started on the storm. Just the fact that you have, you know, the, you know, the water coming in, uh, you know, come, you know, come the evening tide. The conflict between Israel and Palestinians has never been balanced, they say. The stateless Palestinians have never had anything close to the same hard power as their U.S. allied and nuclear armed enemy, which has the Middle East's most powerful military. Yet one card that the Palestinians, uh, excuse me, yet one card that the Palestinians had for many years was the Arab consensus endorsed by all Arab League members, save Egypt and Jordan, that normalized relationships with Israel, they say, could only occur after a Palestinian state is established based on the 1949 to 1967 borders with East Jerusalem at its capital. And listen, this is what is really going to boil down to. And many people don't want to believe that. They'll say, no, God will never give up Jerusalem. He'll never give up East Jerusalem to give over to the Palestinians. But see, what many people don't realize is that God is not doing it at all. It's the people that have turned aside from God. People who have signed this Abrahamic Accord, the signatories, and again, many who are included in the church. Many who have laid hands on these leaders who pose themselves to be leaders, but they're, they're, they're not even equipped to be leaders, let alone to be standing. I, 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 look, this is... I'm telling you, we're living in the last days. You got to be saved. 
You got to be born again. Your name must be written in the Lamb's Book of Life because um, there's so much happening in these end times that you're going to be washed away with this, with this end times days of Noah flood that is going to occur suddenly and without reproach, without apology. And we're told in the book of Revelation that God's judgments are holy and true. We're told in Revelation chapter 11, verse 17, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry. Are we not looking at that? The nations were angry and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead, they, that they should be judged. Friends, the time of the dead is happening right now. Make no mistake about it. They are being judged. And that you, talking about the Most High, you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And again, I say that that is happening right now. And there's another portion of scripture where the word of God tells us that his judgments are righteous. And you can read that in Revelation chapter 15. His judgments are always righteous. And, 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 and okay, so let me share with you another portion of scripture with regards to um, this, what's going to end up happening. Because in the midst of this conflict, uh, you know, Again, I say, regardless of who, who, whomever was going to sit in, 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 in the president's seat, it could have been Trump if he would have won. It, in this case, it's Biden. But it didn't matter who it was. This proves that the Abrahamic Accords did not stand the test of one conflict in the Middle East. It was going to be tested. You're talking about a covenant for crying out loud. In the name of Abraham, <laughs> the same Abraham who believes in Yahweh, who is the father of faith according to scripture? Now, with all due respect, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not going to quote from what the Quran has to say or any other religion. I'm of, I'm of the faith of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ being the only begotten son of God, the same God that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This covenant was going to be tested. And it's failed. That doesn't mean that, you know, uh, you know any, any patriarch failed, but there's just a point clearly being made. And so now what's going to happen is that eventually, what's, and it's going to happen very soon, I mean, sooner than what many people realize, is that you're going to have now Jerusalem. They say East Jerusalem, which is a, it's, it's, it's a hot piece of land. It's, it's, it's been a debated land for, for years, uh, is going to eventually be given over to the Gentiles, the Gentiles being the Palestinian Authority. And you're going to have many people, they're going to say, see, if it wasn't for us, uh, you know, to the, you know, whomever will be leading the Palestinian Authority at that time. If it wasn't for us, you wouldn't have Jerusalem, but now you have it. Now that's going to include, uh, again, the United Arab Emirates, uh, you know, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, Saudi Arabia is going to have their own, you know, pat in the back saying, see, now, uh, you know, the current leader of the Palestinian Authority is uh, Mahmoud Abbas, I believe. Will he still be leading it at that time? We don't know. Okay, there's been, I believe, some 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 hits on on him. <laughs> some some people, including the government of the United States, uh, you know, formerly under the Trump administration, that was seriously considering on taking him out, probably assassinating him, and uh, you know, it didn't happen. Uh, so, uh, but what's going to happen again is that for the sake of bringing peace in the Middle East and for the sake of making it look like that the Abrahamic Accord was not a failure, East Jerusalem is going to be handed over to the Gentiles. Where do I get that? Now, this is scripture. Revelation chapter 11. You got to read this because the moment that that happens and it happens in the seriousness of the timing that we're living in. I, you know, dare I say, you know, it's going to be, it's going to look like, uh, you know, it's going to go back to what took place in the 1967. It's going to be established based on the 1967 borders. It may, but we're talking about this, this, this time, this time is going to include the following. Let me read this portion of scripture to you. If you have your Bible, please go there. Revelation chapter 11, verse one, that I was given a read like a measuring rod. Now this is the apostle John who saw this time. 2,000 years in advance, okay, and he was on the island of Patmos, and he was given all that we're reading. He was given this in dreams and visions, and not as he slept, but in, in the real, in, in the now, if you will. He was taken up to heaven and given all of these to write for our account in the times that we're living in, and this coincides with what Daniel 
uh, you know, what the book of Daniel says. Let me just, I got to read this to you. Keep your spot in Revelation, but let me share with you what Daniel says here. Uh, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, it says, And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Now, this was a time before the fullness of time when Jesus came and went to the cross as a suffering servant, as the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. So the time of Daniel, but Daniel saw dreams and he had visions about the end times, about the book of Revelation, about things that made him sick for days. He sought to serve in the king's court, but he was so troubled and he was just sick for days is what the Bible said. God, he, he was so messed up over what he saw, seriously troubled. And terribly distraught by what he saw, that God had to send an archangel to go and comfort him, bring breath back into his body, and then explain to him what he saw and why he saw it, and how it referred to the times that we're living in now. It's amazing. Biblical insight. Amazing times that we're living in. All right, so now, again, it takes us to Revelation chapter 1. Then I was given a read like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. Could this be the third temple at this time? <laughs> okay, let's continue. Measure the temple of God. Now this, I believe, is Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, the altar and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it. This is that portion of East Jerusalem. For it has been given to the Gentiles. In this case, would be the Palestinian Authority. And all those who would now all of a sudden be their best friend. Because they have none, really, for the most part. People think that they do, but they really don't. They're just used as a pawn as well. Uh, it, it's a mess. It really is. Okay, so the Gentiles also meaning those who do not believe in Jesus being the Messiah. Those who do not believe uh, in, 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 in the Savior of the world. Again, Jesus Christ is Lord. So here it says, For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city. What's the holy city? It's none other than Jerusalem. They're going to tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So this is what's going to happen. And I know many people don't believe it, but that's what's going to happen is that Jerusalem is going to be handed over as a, as a form of peace. Okay, finally, listen, in order for us to end the conflict, you're going to have the nation of Israel going to give in because eventually Benjamin Netanyahu will be replaced. I, I, I you know... I almost want to say I can't imagine this happening under the watch of Benjamin Netanyahu, but you never know. Right now, he's in some kind of personal conflicting situations, and I guess him and his wife, and I don't want to speak too much about it because I don't know much about it. Uh, so I say this very respectfully and in the fear of God. Uh, apparently, they've been involved in some kind of things to where they've had to go to court. So I, I don't know if that would be any leverage or leverage enough to try to intimidate him or, or make him believe that in order for his troubles to go away, he would have to now, uh, you know, bring up East Jerusalem and give it over to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but again, I think eventually uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's reign will come to an end. There's probably going to be a new prime minister that's going to be for handing East Jerusalem over. It's probably waiting in the wings, looking for this opportunity. And if not, then it will be, you know, it's going to be the so-called peacemaker. And the peacemaker will be none other than the Antichrist. Now, he's not going to come in the name of the Antichrist. He's not going to call himself the Antichrist. He's going to call himself eventually God. And it's going to be, it's going to be a time of great tribulation is what the Bible says. Now, I want to uh, share with you more updates concerning the reports here. Uh, and uh, there's a timeline. It says your timeline of Israel and Gaza conflict. So let me share a bit with you on that. And I may have to, anyway, let me just see how far I go here. Okay, so this report came out just today, okay, just hours ago today. It says here, the last few days have been very bloody and violent with Israelis and Palestinians fighting against one another. The violence was sparked by years-long contention between Jewish and Arab people. The conflict all relates to, back to Israel's half-century military occupation of the region, which has led to the eviction of the Palestinians. So here's a timeline of recent events. Ramadan began in, in mid-April. Uh, clashes erupted on Friday, May 7th, as Muslims gathered at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound to pray in honor of Ramadan. Violence then broke out in the holy city and occupied West Bank in the previous week. Palestinians started to throw stones, bottles, and fireworks at police, Israeli police apparently, who returned fire with stun grenades and rubber-coated bullets. More than 200 people were wounded, most of which were Palestinian worshippers, but also included police. On Saturday, May 8th, prayers are held at al Aska, uh, or I, I, if I'm saying this, the name of this mosque incorrectly, forgive me, I try not to mispronounce any name, so uh, anyway, it says here, prayers are held at al Aqsa. Uh, 
at Al-Aqsa Mosque peacefully, <clears throat> excuse me, but violence erupted in East Jerusalem. Uh, the Palestinian Red Crescent said around 120 Palestinians were wounded overnight, many of which were hit by rubber-coated bullets and stun grenades. Israeli police say 17 officers were wounded. Several other countries have expressed deep concern over the violence. On Sunday evening, Israeli police faced off against mostly young Palestinians at several locations in East Jerusalem. A Supreme Court hearing on the eviction of Palestinians from the region was proposed by the Justice Ministry in light of the circumstances was scheduled for Monday, but it was postponed amid the violence. Also, at least 395 Palestinians were wounded just as this Monday alone, this Monday morning, in clashes between Israelis and Palestinians. There was a dramatic escalation of the conflict in the region after Hamas threatened escalation unless Israel pulled its security forces from the compound. Uh, more than 200 rockets were reportedly fired by Palestinian militants. Israeli, uh, excuse me, Israel responds by launching 130 strikes at military targets. Uh, in the Hamas run enclave. 22 Palestinians, including nine children, are killed in the exchange of fire. More rockets were launched from the coastal enclave last Tuesday. Israel forces launched more than 1,000 rockets at Gaza. You had international world leaders at the United Nations calling for peace. Uh, a United Nations official said the escalation in fighting could lead to a full-scale war. Fighting began breaking out across the country in areas with mixed Jewish and Arab populations. It got so bad that you have people uh, you know, apparently sunbathing over at a beach in Tel Aviv, and the moment that they heard sirens, they had to run for cover in their bikinis and 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 in their slippers. So it's just a situation that it is again, it's you know, it's escalated and has broadened across the region. Militants in Gaza revealed they had fired 130 rockets into Israel in response to Israelis' airstrike, which. Uh, felled a multi-story tower. Israel revealed it had killed a senior Hamas official in Gaza on Wednesday. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke of the conflict on Wednesday night. He said he planned to send in military forces to help police maintain order in cities ruptured by violence and said the recent attacks amounted to anarchy. Quote, on Thursday, last Thursday morning, the Israel Defense Forces said around 1,500 rockets had been fired from Gaza into Israeli cities since hostilities escalated on Monday. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza revealed on Thursday more, that more than 400 people have been injured there since the conflict began, in addition to the 67 who have died. The Israeli military sent in ground troops on Friday, just this past Friday, and they were firing in on Gaza. Israel said more than 3,000 rockets were fired into the country in the past week. The overall death toll in the territory now stands at 198, including 58 children. That is a lot. And 34 women who just happen to be in the way, friends, okay? With 1,230 injured, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Israel says more than 130 militants are among the dead, but Hamas has not recognized this. So that is the timeline of, of the conflict. And so I, you know, I, I want to answer the question. The question has been posed, right? It says here, Israel and Palestinian map. Why are Israel and Palestine? And they say Palestine, but I'm going to call it Palestinian Authority because it's not technically, it's not, it's not a state yet. <laughs> so it says here, why are uh, Israel and the Palestinian, uh, why are Israel and the Palestinians at war? Okay. So it says here, Israelis and Palestinians are amid the fiercest and bloodiest violence since 2014 with United Nations officials warning tensions could escalate into an all-out war, but why are Israel and Palestinians at war? We need to look, let's ask the question so we can get an answer. What, why is there a war? Now, I'll quote you scripture here in a moment, but let's see what they have to say. And again, I find it stunning that the Abraham Accords did not, you know, it didn't do anything for this. Anyway, let's continue. Israel forces are now undertaking a fresh round, and that includes even the blood sacrifices that they did. Listen, the Abrahamic Accords supposed to, it was supposed to have worked. The fact that Trump was in office as a type of King Cyrus was supposed to have worked to avoid what we're talking about. Uh, the fact that they shed the blood of, 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 of animals over on a third temple type of altar in Jerusalem more than once within the past 12 to 18 months was supposed to have prevented this. We're living in the last days. They're going to have to pay for that. It's going to be a high cost. Very serious abomination that took place. Let's continue. Israel forces are now undertaking a fresh round of airstrikes on Gaza in the fifth day of hostilities. There is no sign of the bloody warfare between Israelis and Palestinians reaching an end. Individuals involved, now this report came out again earlier today. 
Individuals involved in new eruption of the Israeli-Palestinian bloodshed may be targeted by an international criminal court, ICC, investigation into alleged war crimes, according to its top prosecutor. Israel fired artillery and mounted more airstrikes at Gaza just this past Friday. The country attacked a network of Palestinian militant tunnels beneath Gaza, dubbed the Metro, as Hamas forces continued persistent rocket attacks on Israeli towns. An Israeli military spokesman said ground forces brought in on Friday undertook the pre-dawn raid on the tunnels but had not crossed into the Gaza Strip. The official added the country had struck 150 targets and damaged miles of the tunnel network. Gaza's health ministry today confirmed the death toll had risen again to at least 198 Palestinians overnight. And we already talked about this part. I, I don't mean to repeat myself. Forgive me. Including 58 children and 34 women. Um... So, Assessor, the main point of connection between Israel and Palestinians is decades old. So, uh, apparently, this is supposed to answer the question, why are they both at war? Britain apparently took control of the areas known as Palestinian Authority after the rule of the Ottoman Empire that was defeated in World War I. The land was then inhabited by a Jewish minority and an Arab majority. Tensions between these groups continued to escalate after Britain was assigned the task of creating, and I quote, a national home in Palestine for Jewish people. The region became as become the ancestral home for Jews, but Palestinian Arabs also claimed the land. Over the years, tension continued between Jewish and Palestinian people, with the number of Jews flocking to the area increasing in the wake of the Holocaust. So listen, shortly after the Holocaust, the Jewish people now needed a home, especially in light of over 6 million Jews being annihilated by the hand of Hitler and his regime. From there, violence between Jews and Arabs and against the British rule also grew. The United Nations voted to split the Palestine into two separate Jewish and Arab states, with Jerusalem becoming an international city in the year 1947. This plan was accepted by Jewish leaders, but rejected by the Arab side and therefore was never implemented. The next year, British rulers left the region unable to resolve the ongoing conflict. In the wake of Britain's departure, Jewish leaders declared the creation of Israel, but many Palestinians objected to this and a war began. Hundreds of Palestinians were evicted from their homes in what is called Al-Nakba or the catastrophe. Since then, there has never been a peace agreement and more wars and fighting has continued, although a ceasefire came into force the very next year. This reached a peak level last weekend, as we all know, over the threatened eviction of some Palestinian families over in East Jerusalem and after Palestinians and Israeli police clashed at the al Aska Mosque. The conflict has now seen hundreds of rocket attacks and airstrikes undertaken by Hamas and Israel after weeks of friction. Each side cannot reach an agreement on several issues, including the following. Number one, a plan for what should happen to ousted Palestinian refugees. Number two, whether Jewish settlers in the occupied West Bank should stay or be removed. Number three, whether the two sides should share Jerusalem. And number four, for Palestinian states should be created alongside the nation of Israel. Now, as I end this broadcast, I want to leave with you this portion of scripture that is found in the book of James as to why, uh, you know, according to what the word of God says, why wars actually happen. Where do they come from? Read with me. The book of James, chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires? For pleasure that war in your members, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So here's this portion of scripture written by the Apostle James, being led and inspired by the Spirit of God to do so, in the fear of God, so that God himself can intervene in this situation. If you would just hear him for a moment, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying during this time. God is taking a moment to intervene in this situation and say, listen, the fact that you guys are even fighting with each other, the fact that you guys are trying to uh, be one with each other without me, I'm calling you out as an adulterer and an adulteress, and now you've become an enemy of me. So what does he continue to say? He says, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world will make himself an enemy of God. There's no gray area in this. There's no middle ground. I know people want to have a middle ground, and then they, they dare bring the name of Abraham in this uh, middle ground, in this gray area, and say, well, we'll just call it an Abrahamic accord, and our father Abraham will understand because he is the father of many faiths. That's not at all what the Bible says. 
How, I mean, you wouldn't like if somebody said that about you. Now I'm talking to the leaders, the signatories who, who included themselves in on this. They will never allow this to happen if they can, if they can prevent it on their own time, on their own watch. And yet they dare use the name of Abraham to construe something that will never hold and now make God look like a liar. And God says, now you've made yourself an enemy of me because the one who was truly a friend of God was Abraham. I'm saying this in light of all that's taking place with regard to the nation of Israel and the Gaza conflict. And so the word of God continues, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, here's the remedy. I don't know if many people will take it. <laughs> they like to take the medicine of this world. But they don't like to take the medicine of God, but I'm going to bring it out anyway. Here's the remedy. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. I just shared with you double-mindedness according to the word of God. According to the same man of God who wrote the scripture. Being led to do so by the spirit of God. James chapter 1. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and will be given to him. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I just watched a movie yesterday called Mrs. Doubtfire. And I'm thinking, what a name, Doubtfire. Strange fire. You doubt the fire, right? I mean, it says doubting. And, and again, a double-minded man is, is unstable in all his ways. And so the whole thing is very interesting. Dare I say even possibly intriguing in light of all that's taking place in the times that we're living in. Um, so again, the remedy is to submit to God. Resist the devil. When you submit to God, by default, you're resisting the devil and he will flee from you. And the word flee here means literally flee in terror because you're, you're submitting yourself to God. And that is done when you submit in your, and surrender your life to Jesus. You have to be in a, in a spirit of surrender. It's like what these nations are demanding and commanding each other to do. If they would just do it unto the Lord themselves, God will go on their behalf and calm the situation down. At least calm it. We'll see what happens, folks. But uh, it goes on to say here again, uh, draw near to God he, and he will draw near to you. And I love that. I love that. God, God will never abandon you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he's looking for us to draw to him. He loves us that much. He says, if you just draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. That's love. And he says here, cleanse your hands, you sinners. And again, purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then it says the following. What happens when you do that genuinely, this is what happens. You, it says lament and mourn and weep. That will be the result. And that's a good thing. It may not seem good. It may not even feel very good when it takes place, but it is necessary. And it's done by the Lord because of what you've done in the following. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And then you think of the Beatitudes, right? It was constantly quoted, but not, you know, in the way that it ought to be. When you, you know, because it says here, well, you know, I mean, you know, some may say, well, I don't know if I want to humble myself if it's going to mean that my laughter is going to be turned to mourning and my joy to gloom. Listen, God's not going to leave you in that state. Again, that's a result of you actually um, going before the Lord so that your double mindedness could be brought to nothing by the spirit of God. And what will eventually happen again, he's not going to leave you in that state. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What's going to happen according to the Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew chapter five. It says here, if you're poor in spirit, you're going to actually receive the kingdom of heaven. If you mourn, you're going to be comforted. If you're hungry and thirsty, you will be filled with righteousness. If you show mercy, you're going to be pure in heart. And, and more. So, folks, you need to give your life to the Lord. The day of the Lord is at hand. This is to all who have ears to hear. And listen, we're living in the last days. I'm telling you, time is up. Just get, 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 get right with God. Don't be shy to ask God to help you. Don't be shy. If you have submitted and surrendered your life to God, know that you may be in a time of consecration. You may be in a time of sanctification. You may be in a time seemingly of a wilderness season, a time of testing, but God is with you. And it's not to set you up to fail, but it sets you up to succeed 
to prosper, be in health, and, and what's it say in, in, in the word of God? May you be in health and prosper even as your soul prospers. And your soul must be saved. Your soul must be healed and renewed. And your soul is, 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 is your mind, your, your will, your emotions. And, and then your spirit must be born again. This is all the work of God. And so you submitting and surrendering your life to Jesus do it now. And I, I pray that God help you in all this, that he really manifests himself to you in these areas so that you can receive the fullness of God in the times that we're living in. It's needed, friends. Truly, the day of the Lord is at hand. I want to say thank you so much for tuning in to today's Open Your Eyes People broadcast. As always, it is a privilege and a pleasure to bring to you all the word of God, breaking world news headlines, matching biblical prophecy. I want to invite you to visit my website, learn more about my ministry at www openyoureyespeople.com www.openyoureyespeople.com I want to also invite you to become a monthly partner help support the work of this end time ministry your donations help make the work of this end time ministry possible you could become a monthly partner uh, or, or you could just donate uh, as, as you're able uh, but I, I'm going to ask that you help support it with the donation and that shows your love and um, I'm grateful and so may the Lord bless you until the next broadcast may you all continue uh, to receive and be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye.